Hi guys. I think I recognize most of you, so I'm just gonna say hi. And I know it's the last official presentation of the last day of what's been a pretty kick-ass conference. So your brain is probably, I know Kurt's brain is like full of stuff. So we're gonna have fun, but you're gonna have to pay attention too, because this is a panel. So we're gonna rely on a lot of questions from you guys. So pay attention. Um, to introduce Tony Brock, whose middle name is April. You may not know that. Um, <laughs> Tony is uh, with Think LA. He's the association manager. If you don't know Think LA because you're not from that area, you probably have some uh, experience with some sort of interactive marketing association, and that's what Think LA is. They're also, as I described, one of the most robust users of the Shipple Tendency software. Tony uses the hell out of it, and it's awesome. Um, April Guzik is with AIGA in Houston. Now, we won't hold it against her, but she's originally from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but she corrected herself, and so she's ended up in Houston, and she's been to... <laughs> it's that Texas pride, you know? You can take me to California, but it's still going to stay. Uh, so she's been in Houston working with Keystone uh, for eight years, right? In marketing and... Five years. Oh, five cents. Five years, sorry. Um, so she's been working in kind of the marketing and, and media space with them, and then is now uh, with... Also, that's her day job. AIGA is uh, her nonprofit passion. So what we're going to talk about um, is kind of, you know, some ways that these two guys have been able to work with their organizations to just make things rock. Um, so we're just going to start off with, I'm going to turn it over to Tony and let him kind of uh, talk about Think LA and a little bit of the stuff that he's been doing. Then April will fill us in on her work and then we'll go from there with questions. Do you want to use that one? Hi there, so my name is Tony Brock and I'm the association manager at Think LA. And I actually just tweaked this presentation this afternoon, so that's probably why you haven't seen me around. I changed everything around because I decided I wanted to speak on a slightly different topic. So my new title is Associations Are Dying, But They Can Be Saved. So my purpose of the presentation is to kind of tell you a little bit about our organization, but also to tell you about where we're going in the future and kind of how we see uh, other associations and other nonprofits evolving in the future as well. So to give you a little backstory, Think LA started in 2006. So it's a relatively new organization, but we have a very rich history that actually goes back to 1912. And that's when the Advertising Club of Los Angeles was founded. If you fast forward a few decades, there was also the uh, Los Angeles Advertising Agencies Association and the Magazine Representatives Association were founded. Now over the next you know, couple of years, probably decades, what they found was their memberships were becoming more and more similar, and they were getting feedback from their members saying, well, we're having trouble keeping track of, of the different dues and, and when we have to pay, and you have three different calendars, but we're going to everybody's events. And so those three boards collectively got together in 2005, and over the course of several months, decided to actually merge those associations into uh, what's now known as Think LA. It was rebranded, but carried the history of all those other associations with it. So today, Think LA is an extremely robust organization. Uh, even though we're regional in Los Angeles, our reach in the, uh, the LA market is to over 10,000 people. Uh, most of our members are working in marketing companies or advertising companies. They work in companies like Google, Yahoo, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, they also work in advertising agencies that handle big clients, some of the largest brands in the world. Uh, in the automotive category, uh, Lexus, Toyota, Honda, Acura, uh, Mazda, VW, Land Rover. In the entertainment category, all of the studios, Sony, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Universal, Lionsgate, uh, Capitol Records. Uh, even though automotive and entertainment are the largest categories that, in the LA market, you might be surprised to learn that uh, some other familiar brands to you are also handled uh, by some of our members. Uh, for instance, CeCe's Pizza and uh, Hardee's are both uh, handled out of Los Angeles. So uh, there is quite literally multi-billion dollar marketing industry in Los Angeles. And much of that money is passed between the members of our organization. I'm actually gonna stay on today. So. <laughs> Uh, so we're actually very lucky that we have a very active organization. It's, it's a blessing and a curse. Because they're so active, we actually produce over 40 events every year. 
We produce events uh, from a monthly mixer called Thirsty Thursday, which is free to attend and usually draws about 100 people, uh, to events like the one uh, pictured here, which uh, just happened a few weeks ago. It's a Battle of the Bands event that we do, uh, which engages the entire community. We actually sold out the House of Blues and had over 1,300 people in attendance at that event. So that was pretty crazy. But uh, aside from, from the events and, and our membership and where we're at currently, I think the more interesting question is what are we going to be doing tomorrow? And what are we going to be doing a year from now? And even 10 years from now? And to answer those questions, we really need to focus on a couple of trends that have been emerging. And the big topics that are going to be affecting associations in the future are the economy, technology, and demographics. And the reason why the economy is going to affect associations is pretty obvious. If you know, you've been reading any of the news, it's pretty crummy right now. And it doesn't look like it's going to be getting any better anytime soon. So whenever somebody engages with your organization, whether it's to pay for a membership, or to purchase a registration for an event, or to post a job on the job board, anytime there's money involved, that transaction is going to be scrutinized. And they're going to want to see substantial value for their investment. Technology is another big uh, trend that's going to be affecting associations. Associations are historically terrible at adopting new technology. And what I mean by this is, have you guys ever Googled a name of anybody? Have you used Facebook? Have you used LinkedIn? Well, associations, including ours, still tote their membership directory as a benefit of being a member. It's not necessary to have a directory. You can find way more information about somebody than you could ever find through our membership directory, just through a simple Google search. So <clears throat> the technology is actually really important. And for us, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because our members are pioneering a lot of this technology and they're rolling it out through their clients and these major brands. So the expectation is for us to embrace that technology and kind of be on the forefront and representative of the future of marketing. So the third major uh, trend that's going to affect associations is actually demographics. And this one is, is pretty interesting because it has to do with uh, value systems. So uh, right now, a lot of boomers are starting to retire and associations have historically catered to boomers, and it, it was kind of a symbiotic relationship because boomers were instilled with uh, a need to serve, and uh, they joined associations because it was the right thing to do. Well, now that they're retiring, they're not feeling the need to actually belong to associations anymore. So the market is really about Gen X and Gen Y. And in 2015, Gen X and Gen Y are actually gonna be the majority of the workforce. So associations have done very little to engage Gen X, let alone Gen Y. Gen Y specifically values learning, uh, they value uh, leading, and they value giving back. And so if, if your association is not meeting those values, you're not gonna be able to connect with them on any meaningful level. So let me see, what's my next slide here? I guess, well, let me go back. So for, uh, for Think LA, so what we're actually doing in the future, uh, a few things that we're looking at, uh, number one, is investing in our, in our technology, in our infrastructure. And what we're looking to do is actually uh, create a presence much larger than our website. We're looking at uh, a mobile optimized site. We're looking at creating apps to uh, engage people to let them register for an event uh, when they're not necessarily in front of a computer. And uh, we're also looking at new uh, distribution platforms for our content, uh, basically to engage these Gen Y users and Gen X users we want to be able to give them the content when they want to receive it on the platform with which they want to receive it on, if that makes sense. So what I'm saying is we're going to start live streaming our events. People aren't able to come to events in person anymore. Everybody's really busy right now. People are going to want to access that content in a, a video archive. You can watch it you know, over your lunch break. You can Basically take it, if you're a traveling salesperson, you'd be able to watch it on your smartphone on a plane trip across the country. That, those are the kind of uh, tech, technological advances that we're looking to make. The second thing that, that we're really looking to do in the future is actually our content itself. Uh, we're looking at uh, developing greater, uh, greater speaker events with uh, world-class speakers. We had one last year with Ariana Huffington, which was one of the best received events we ever did. So we're looking to do more of those things. We're looking to create a certification program. Uh, and kind of our, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to 
create a, an advertising and marketing school in Los Angeles in partnership with uh, potentially UCLA or USC or even Otis uh, College of Art and Design. So that's really kind of where our headspace is at right now. Um, but aside from that, if there's any other organization out there that's failing to take into account the power that technology has to advance their organization and to further their mission and goals, that organization is going to fail. And that's, that's the reality, is we need to embrace these changes. So I'm going to leave you with uh, a few final thoughts here. Uh, in, in our mind, we're never going to be done with the association. There's always going to be something to change. And really, change is survival. It's the only way that the associations are going to continue to exist. Uh, so you really have two choices. Either let the change happen, because it's going to happen whether you like it or not, and let it happen and pass you by and close your doors in five to 10 years, or embrace the change and control it and actually drive it forward. And uh, there's actually one quote here that, uh, that I thought kind of summed this up very well, which was strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value. And uh, 10,000 shipple points to anybody that knows who said that. Nobody? Guess? Uh, not Steve Jobs. Wasn't Ed Shipple? <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> uh, Albert Einstein, and I would say he's pretty successful, but he he operated on the mantra of being a value. So that's really what's going to drive associations forward is providing value. Um, if you guys need additional inspiration, these are a couple books that, that I've read recently that. Uh, actually provided a lot of the content uh, for my presentation. Uh, the first one is Race for Relevance, and the second one is The End of uh, Membership as We Know It. Uh, they're both published by the ASAE, the uh, American Society of Association Executives. Uh, short read, 120 pages each, um, but just full of really, really good content and really good ideas uh, for making these changes and making these leaps to move associations forward. So. That's it. I guess we'll uh, we'll take questions uh, after the uh, the panel portion. So I'll hand it over to April. Awesome job. That was really good. I have to follow up with that. Jesus. Okay. So my presentation is called "Show Me Some AIJ Love." Um, you got to give to get. Um, like April was saying, awesome name by the way. Um, I am creative director of Keystone Resources. I've been in Houston for five years. When I moved here for a year and a half, I loathed this place. I wanted to go back to Chicago so bad. But then I got involved in AIGA, and ever since my life has changed upside down, right side, left side, 360, you name it. So, like-minded creatives. Um, we're all about different races, different colors, different backgrounds, different communities based on everything. So this is kind of a representation. I art directed this, and my best friend, Mike Toman, actually shot it. So a little about AIGA, we're the Professional Association for Design. We have 66 chapters nationwide, more than 22,000 members across the nation. We're all volunteer based. We don't get paid for what we do. We do this from the bottom of our bleeding creative gut. Um, our Houston chapter is 359 members strong, 136 professionals, 185 students, and 11 corporation groups. We have a board of directors, which is seven strong, Chairs and committee members at 12, and volunteer base about 15 to 20. Email list serve is at 2444, active con contact. So basically, when I send out anything that has to do with our chapter, it's going to 1,200 people. Our email, our social media is 1,200, our Twitter is 31, and our LinkedIn is 500. So basically, my biggest thing, and since I've become president, is to promote local talent and local growth. So the Heights Theater is one of my favorite venues. They're very, very awesome. They put us up on the marquee. When you drive by, it's kind of like this fame moment for us. Again, shot by Mike. He's an amazing photographer. So my whole thing is when you kind of get in an organization, you want to get your buzz on. That doesn't mean alcohol-induced buzz. So it needs to be inspiring. It needs to be educational. You need to get creative with your budget, especially foods and drink, or drinks and food. So I remember one time we actually had a social, and our biggest like, loss for it was our $800 like, catering bill for Nico Nico's. One of the board members went home with 15 pounds of Euro meat because we didn't promote that we were having food, so everybody came and they, they weren't hungry. 
So you have to get creative. So now we kind of do like, you know, if you're gonna drink there, then we'll like find a local sponsor. Like I have an event on the 20th and it's being sponsored by one of my friends that owns a beer company. So it's really great to like connect with the people and network and really kind of go, ooh, you have something. So I can promote you and your brand by putting you as a sponsor for one of our events. There's even a place for wallflowers. So I go out of my way to kind of find somebody that's kind of lurking in the back and I pull them and I grab them and I'm like, you know what, you're gonna be my friend for the day. I'm gonna introduce you to everybody that I've met because I used to be the newbie, the wallflower, and now I'm leading a complete local chapter. Um, again, support your local growth. So find companies that are new, find companies you know, that need a little extra nudge, find companies that you can team up with that all fall in initiatives. Be a trend watcher. Um, I know that you were saying like, you know, um, the industry for like marketing and online and media and streaming your events live and stuff like that. Be on the verge of greatness because your members will fall in love with everything that you do. Don't stick to what you know. We were based on print and now we're merging with the trends. And pull your members. It's important to ask your members what they wanna hear. You can say the same thing over and over again and they may get tired of that and fall off. And then you're like, where did our members go? Well, because you sat there and talked about print for 20 years. We're merging, we're growing. We need to grow with our members and with our community. So here is our awesome AIJ Piggy. <laughs> we actually bring him to all of our events and his name is Piggy. How original, right? Um, last year, incredibly, the year before that, um, we lost $736. When I became president, we made three, $3,333, which is kind of awesome for it all to be like threes. Um, we had a total of 25 events. That was two new member orientations, four student-focused events, and three speaker events. And the rest of them, you know, basically were kind of whatever we felt. And we actually themed every single month to be photography or typography and branched out to other type of mediums that weren't just base, print. Print is the underlining thread. We don't need to focus on that anymore. We need to go bigger. So much to do, so little time. So kind of my one big goal that I'm going forward with, and this was the whole kind of like to infinity and beyond, so I hope you guys kind of got that reference. Um, I really believe in co-hosting and collaborating with other organizations. Really, honestly, like, everybody's doing all these great things, and that's one of my biggest things, is that we're all burning our resources at the same time. And so maybe you may get like 50 people here, 50 people there, but think about if you actually combine your resources and you actually put your money together, you can have a bigger event and do bigger things, and then you get 100 people to actually come. So why are we all doing the same thing at the same time and kind of overloading all of our members with these 10,000 Facebook invites? Because literally I have like 20 plus sitting in my inbox right now, and I'm like this kind of overload. Um, color outside the lines with programming. Do things that you see other people kind of doing it into your own twist. Um, I'm actually hosting a roast, um, which Ed Chippel is actually going to be part of. I'm very excited. Um, if Comedy Central you can do it, I can do it. Just saying. Um, join forces with the indies out there. So if there's independent groups that are like, no organizations, we don't want to do that, we like to do this. Well, we're talking about the same thing. So why not join up? My basic goal isn't to get members. If I build a strong community and I build a strong organization, my members will come. Um, we're planning for Design Week next year. Design Week isn't just based on design. It's about building a community and building a foundation in Houston for everybody to stay and love and scream and tweet and Facebook and blog and walk and talk our community. I loved Chicago. I love Houston way more. It's really hard for me to say. I probably, oh, it's tape, crap. Um, yeah, I'll dub that part out. <laughs> um, but my biggest thing is, is that I love Houston. I want everybody in this world to know that how much I love Houston. I want to fight with those Austin people. I'm sorry if there's anybody from Austin here, but I really seriously, yeah, I love you. You can come over to this side whenever you want to. It's all right. No? Okay, see? See, you're stuck to Austin. I, I kind of love Houston now. It's okay. We'll play. Yeah. Um, so my big thing is Design Week needs to combine all of the different crafts. Architectural, you know, marketing, digital, anything across the board, we need to come together and we need to support the local Houston society. Um, so if you build it, they will come, simply said. And it never hurts to ask. So when I get creative with my budgets, if I know somebody that's doing something, be like, okay, well, would you give like a 25% like nonprofit discount type of deal? And so usually a majority of the time they're either like no, but at least I asked. 
So, yo, I'm speaking to you. Um, basically, to be a kick-ass member, um, you have to use your creative outlet. Use us as your creative outlet. Do designs for us, get involved, speak your mind. I basically, if you have anything, I will put you in the forefront and I will like blast your name out to everybody. It's not about me and it's not about my ego. It's, it's about you and building your community and your networking. Have a voice, speak up. I swear to God, I will do anything that you tell me to do if it's a cool idea and it's really combining our community. Um, I give you some face time. I'd rather you invest in positive energy the negative energy, because honestly, you waste more time and effort doing something and kind of like going, oh yeah, I don't want to be part of that organization because they did this. Well, then tell me like why I should do something that you want me to do. Um, five hours is plenty of time, I promise, but I'll want more if you're good. It's really hard to find really good organized people. Um, be a doer, not a talker. Too many times people fall in love with what you're saying. and If you don't follow up, you're going to lose members. You're going to lose followers. You're going to lose your community. So do something instead of talking about doing it. Um, and basically, because of AIJ, um, I land at my job. And it's completely changed the way that I see Houston and I see my creative community. And I'm very excited going forward with anything that has to do with kind of grabbing onto that trend setting and watching and always innovative and learning new things and listening to my members and making sure that we give you guys a kick-ass membership base. And, yeah, we do get people that say, oh yeah, your membership is too, it's too much. Give me a year of your time. I'll let you on my board. I'll give you FaceTime. Let me prove to you why our organization is something that you need to grasp onto. So, thanks. So I have a big question. You both have really successful organizations. You made a profit last year, April, which for most nonprofits, they don't. Um, and then Tony, you sold out the House of Blues, which you know most bands would don't even get anywhere near close to that. Um, so I think a lot of uh, organizations would want to know, like, what's your secret sauce? You know, what is it that you guys do that gets your member base excited about your events, gets them actually buying tickets, and then showing up? That's three tough things to do. I don't think that there's really necessarily a secret sauce. I think it's being organized and being your own, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yes, thank you. There you go. Um, you need to live it. You need to breathe it. Just as much as you love your career and you go around and you're like, I'm a creative and I live, sleep, breathe, and eat it, tattoo it on yourself. You know, like, you need to do the same with your organization. If you're going to put in 25% of your time, then don't even invest your time in the organization. We need people that love it just as much as they love their career. And when they actually grasp onto that, they'll follow you and they'll want to kind of fall in love with everything that you give them. So that's kind of the secret sauce. Making sure that your prices aren't outrageous. You know, you're not going to charge $35 for, you know, a social. Like, make sure it's kind of cost effective. So the lower the, you know, the pricing and the better you do about promoting it, that's the secret sauce. Yeah, I, I, I think for us, the, the biggest thing is we know our audience and we know what drives them. Uh, whether they're our members or not, uh, we're still speaking to them. Uh, the price point is, is actually very, um, very important. And what we try to do is, is secure sponsors that are trying to get in front of our audience to help offset a lot of those costs and keep our prices low. Um, but the, the way that, that we've done, like with the House of Blues event, uh, getting that large, that, that event actually has about 18 years of history behind it. And, and so I think consistency is key. And when you have something good and you're getting feedback from the members that it's good, you should keep doing it. And uh, what we did was we, we grew that event over time. And uh, it, it started out the, you know, 18 years ago, there was maybe 70 people at that event. Um, but we kept doing it. And, and another big factor is choosing the right venue, right sizing the venue. It, for 70 people to go to the House of Blues, it's going to look empty. But there's venues in, in Los Angeles, and I'm sure here in Houston or anywhere across the country that, that are going to be the right size venue for the event that you're trying to do. So we took that event up. Uh, we really started growing it in, uh, in 2007 from 600 people. The next year was 800. Um, the year after that was you know, 1,000. Um, this year, you know, over 1,300. 
and, and really what it is when you choose the right size venue and it sells out, that's not a bad thing. You don't necessarily need to accommodate everybody that wants to go because what happens is when you do your next event, it's a self, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Everybody says, oh man, that last event sold out. I have to go to this next event. So it, it really helps generate buzz by doing that. And I think most associations, you know, you kind of mentioned April, have, you know, the core group of members that are going to get involved, want to be on the board, things like that. But there's also, uh, I think, a large peop- you know, group of people that aren't members but still want to support, still want to go to your events. How do you guys take, uh, I don't want to say advantage, but maximize, you know, the involvement that you're getting from that greater community? I think probably everyone in here that's involved with an association has seen membership levels drop because corporations are dropping back on their budgeting that they give for people to sign up for them. But those people still want to be involved. So what, do you, what kind of things do you guys do to take advantage of that you know, community that is uh, made up of non-members? Well, I, I think for us, uh, what we do, there, there's really two types of non-members. There's, there's non-members that know about you and uh, simply aren't engaged on a meaningful, active level. And then there's non-members that simply don't even know you exist. Uh, so th- those would be your prospective members. Uh, for us, for uh, the non-members that don't know we exist, it's th- that, that's kind of our fault. It, it's an awareness problem. And we need to do a better job of, of branding ourselves and getting our name out there and just letting them know that we're there for them. But for the non-members that, uh, that know we exist but aren't involved on, on a meaningful level, uh, it, it's really what we try to do is uh, offer non-member pricing to a lot of our events. It's more expensive than the member pricing, um, but but we still try to have an outlet for them to to be involved in the organization. Um, I 100% agree with you. You know, there's two basically non-members, um, the people that we don't really promote to, and that's what we're kind of doing. But my other thing is that as a non-member, I will give you a chance to, again, come into our organization for a year and really get involved. And then at that time, you really kind of have to evaluate, all right, am I going to pay the member pricing or am I going to stay a non-member? And then I kind of have to take your title away, which I haven't done that yet and I don't want to. Um, So I really kind of define like why it has changed my life and how much it's done for me. And I think that usually majority of the time gets them sold. And I, I kind of find ways also that the people are like, well, if I just go to all events and pay the non-member pricing, it's the same as your, you know, the full membership pricing. Well, what we're doing over the next year is we're holding more members-only things. Um, we're doing plugged-in series. We're doing unplugged series. Working with a lot of local kind of celebrities and kind of using that as bait to dangle in front of non-members. But we'll always love our non-members. They're amazing. They're part of our community. So we always just kind of bring them along for the road. Kind of going back to that with, you know, the way we kind of have this almost competitive nature that's come up between a lot of associations as people cut back on their budgets and it's harder for, you know, companies to allocate funds for membership and even attending events. How have you guys been able to, you know, leverage your relationships with other organizations to kind of benefit your own? And we don't have to all go to the, you know, extremes that Think LA did with merging, you know, from three different groups. But I know even now you guys are still you know, connecting with other organizations in the area that helps boost your overall attendance and memberships. Yeah, I mean, we we love collaboration and we love working with other organizations. And it, it in technical terms, they're all competitors of ours. They're they're all doing events of ours. They're they're trying to reach one segment of our membership, but we don't really see that as an issue because it, it's uh, as I mentioned before, there's there's kind of a symbiotic relationship and both parties can actually get something out of it. So we like to partner with people that help us further our mission and goals, um, which is to educate people, connect people, promote Los Angeles as, as a world center of creativity, uh, to help with, uh, with training, and uh, to, to just help with uh, collaboration and highlighting some of the great stories that, that come out from uh, the companies that are in close proximity in Los Angeles. Uh, what, one of the, the really cool events that, that we did in recent history was uh, a collaboration with uh, Variety Magazine and uh, UCLA um, Center for uh, Marketing uh, and Entertainment uh, Media. And they actually got us uh, a, a really phenomenal speaker that drew this huge audience that we would have never had access to because it, we used uh, the, the UCLA school 
to help us promote it. Variety Magazine, we actually put an ad in the magazine as part of a trade sponsorship with them. And so that event ended up being about uh, eight or 900 people, uh, which, which was phenomenal for us. But it, it tapped us into a brand new market. And uh, on the back end, we actually saw some conversions to new memberships. I think teaming up with other organizations, we just got done teaming up with RDA and um, MFA. And we had Pablo Ferro that came in, which was absolutely amazing. We sold out the auditorium completely. They came to us and they asked us you know, to kind of put up sponsorship money. And it's great because our bank account is pretty thriving right now, which I'm very glad to say. So it's other organizations realizing that I don't want to compete with you for members. I want to collaborate. I want to do things. And if they choose to be a member of your association, I'm absolutely grateful that they're part of any association in Houston. So my goal isn't to kind of poach your members. It's to share the inspiring and educational events. We talked a bit about you know getting more members and how to bring people that are non-members into the community. What would you describe as your perfect member? What is it that they do that makes you so excited to have them part of your organization? Uh, they renew on time. <laughs> it, it really, really helps with our cash flow uh, when people renew on time. But uh, it, aside from that, uh, the perfect member is one that, that's passionate about the industry, that's passionate about the organization, and, and somebody that wants to be involved and wants to become, uh, I, I think the word he used was an ambassador um, for, for the brand and for the city and really adopts uh, the philosophy. Um, yes, definitely people that renew on time is amazing. Also the ones that get you the corporation sponsorships because that leads to great sponsorship money. But I think the perfect member, honestly, is one that knows that they have a home with us. They can talk about the crazy like-minded stuff that the rest of their family wouldn't understand at all. We can kind of spew out that kind of you know, industry talk. One that comes and they just know that they're absolutely there for all the right reasons. They have a creative mind. That's simply my, my perfect member. And you both talked about you know, things you were kind of looking forward to in the future of your organizations. Tell us what's the one thing you're most excited about, uh, the new idea, the new program, and then what can we do as part of the you know, ShippleCon community to help you guys uh, reach that goal? I, I think for us, the, the thing that we're most excited about is uh, the potential to uh, collaborate and actually build uh, a world-class marketing and advertising school uh, in partnership with one of the universities in Los Angeles. Um, so I, I guess it, if you guys have connections at those universities, if you sit on the board or anything like that and can help us out, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing free pitch advertising here, but we're doing Design Week 2012 next year, and AIJ is gonna act as kind of the head umbrella, but we're asking all the other organizations, companies, whatever, to kind of pick a day and co-opt with us and collaborate, and let's throw a really badass like day of a week. It's full six days, Monday through Friday. Saturday is gonna be a huge gala industry party where we're giving everybody that basically teams up with us 30 minutes on stage to give away scholarships, awards, kind of use that time to really bring everybody underneath one roof. And what we're hoping to get out of that is to raise money to find a collaborative co-working space in Houston that we can all use for events, for conferences, for offices, for all the organizations. Because it's time that we stop competing and we start collaborating and really building a very unique, diverse Houston community. We have so much talent and amazing, amazing things going on, but it's all like underground industry stuff. And that's the reason for a year and a half, I had no clue how amazing Houston could be. So my goal next year, and that's kind of like my mission, is to kind of bring the Houston creative community, no matter what you are, what you do, to the forefront and put us on a national like awareness level. So I warned you guys, you have to stay awake and pay attention because I would expect questions. So what do you guys want to hear about? Aaron Long. So creating hype. Uh, I guess you need this. 
I, I don't think there's any one thing in particular, but it, it's, a, it's a combination of, of different things. Uh, we utilize social media pretty heavily, and over the last uh, two to three years, we've actually done, I think, a pretty good job of, of building up those communities. We have uh, about 4,000 followers on Facebook, uh, 6,000 on LinkedIn, uh, 3,000 on, on Twitter, and uh, we actually had to hire a full-time community manager now to, to manage those. So we, we tap into the audiences via, via social. Um, we, we kind of get them where they belong. We have uh, what we call uh, moles that work in these various companies that, that advocate on our behalf uh, to tell all their coworkers about it. Um, and we send probably way more emails than anybody would care to receive, but <laughs> It, it, it does work, so uh, it just promotion, promotion, promotion. Um, yeah, I think that, that sums it up. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. Um, the other thing, too, is kind of finding venues that can hold maybe 50 people and saying, you know, when it gets at, like, the 35 mark, you're like, 10 more seats left, and then mm -hmm. it just goes like that. Um, and it's also kind of, you know, when we're at events, talking about the next series of events. I just redesigned our event newsletter that basically has the two upcoming events for the next two weeks. And then, oh, guess what? This is on the radar. This is all the great things going on. So it's just really kind of e-blasting and filling up their inbox and using social media. We have one of our members right now doing a small commercial for an art festival that we're holding on the 5th. Again, free promotion. Um, so it's kind of utilizing people's awesome talent to do these really great things that gets everybody really excited about it. But doing small venues really, really helps. Yeah, I always just tell people there's only 10 spots left, no matter how much. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can, Garrett. So the question is for Tony, you know, where's your center of membership in the LA area? Uh, uh, technically speaking, our, our membership base is Los Angeles County. Um, but if anybody's ever been to Los Angeles, traffic is, is terrible. And so what we've had to do is kind of look at, at the data on where the majority of our members live and work, and that's where we've been hosting our events. But that doesn't preclude people from uh, becoming a member or becoming involved. Uh, we actually have a fairly large uh, constituency in San Francisco um, and down in San Diego. Uh, looking at, at Google Analytics, we've been getting hits from uh, international. I don't think they'll ever come to any of our events, but um, th that's why I was talking about the, the advances that we need to make in the, these technological leaps uh, to, to digitize our content and look at new distribution models so that we don't have to confine ourselves to, to one region per se. We can, you know, put this stuff online and it's accessible by, by somebody in, uh, in Thailand or uh, in London. Uh, it, it's no longer constrained by, by the geography. Does that answer your question? And that kind of makes me think, and it's probably better directed towards you, but I know in the Bay Area, you have a lot of people who organizations will hold events at 530 in the city which is great if you work in the city and live in the city, but if you don't, you're not going to go because you need to get to a train because it's going to take you an hour to get home and then vice versa. And I think Houston's a lot the same way where, well, you don't have public transportation, but you still have, you know, the traffic and the, the terrible, you know, if someone's working in the woodlands, they're not going to make an event down, you know, in South Houston. Do you experience that? What kind of solutions do you guys have for those kind of issues? Um, we typically, we hold a pre-social from about 6.30 until 7, uh, maybe 7.15, really kind of, you know, based on our pre-registration, we can kind of gear when we start. Um, and then we also then do a speaker event for 45 minutes, and we hold a post-social. So if you can't come for the pre-social, then you have the post-social. And then we also usually take our speakers out for drinks afterwards, which is really awesome because people that couldn't even make the social or the speaker event still have the opportunity to meet these amazing people. 
Now, one of the advantages that we do have where you guys are based just in LA is that we do have 66 chapters across the nation. So we all have AIJ as our hub, but then we all have local events. So we have AIJ Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas, and then Houston. So kind of no, no matter where you are in, in Texas, you have a home base. Yes, in the back. Based on our membership, uh, for instance, there, if, if you're familiar with ad agencies and the roles that, that people have in an ad agency, um, a lot of the people that are really involved in our organization come from uh, media planning or media buying, or on the flip side, uh, the, the sales vendors that are working in tandem with them. So we're looking at creating uh, certifications to be uh, a certified advertising sales executive or a certified uh, media planner. It, it's basically furthering the education that, that they've got uh, through their uh, college, and also furthering their on-the-job training um, to, to provide a little more, um, I guess, just industry knowledge and, and something to add to their resume. I'm going to go red in the back, and then you, and then you. <laughs> So appealing to two different, you know, demographics. I think planning things and getting them involved with relevancy, um, with alum and people that are kind of like the legacy of our chapter, having more of like roundtable discussions and bringing them in and actually having them speak and kind of like put them up on the pedestal because they've done such the footwork is a great way to keep their involvement. And then with the other kind of side of the spectrum, it's again doing those type of things that educational, bringing in really good speakers, making sure that you're working with them, giving them mentors, and hooking up the two kind of brackets of our legends and our, and our new generations. Uh, I, I think for us, it, it, it really has to do with that demographic shift and how do you reach uh, that generation Y. And uh, one of the things that, that we started doing uh, that, that's actually working pretty well is we've, we've started doing philanthropic events. And uh, they're held uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday, which is atypical for most of our events, which are held during the week uh, because they're business events. But uh, we took uh, recently 50 people down to the LA Food Bank to volunteer on a Saturday. And uh, just a donation of uh, you know, four hours of their time on a Saturday morning. And uh, people loved it. So it, it's finding those outlets that, that really appeal uh, to those generations. But, as far as a fundraising aspect, our, our model is a little bit different. We don't uh, tap into uh, stu university students or, or alumni uh, for donations. Um, we're not a 501c3. We're set up as a, a 501c6. Um, so it's a, a technical uh, tax differentiation, but we're not a charity. We're uh, more of a chamber of commerce role. Um, but we did also set up uh, recently with our website redesign uh, a student membership type to get students more involved and we're, we're actually still building out those resources and uh, kind of uh, test piloting a, a mentorship program right now with uh, a few local universities to uh, onboard those students into our community. Does that answer your question? It's really hard. It, it's taking, um, I kind of have to wear a different hat depending on who I talk to. Um, and that's why it's like I have a full-time job, but I have another full-time job. 
And I sometimes like, you know, have to flash where I'm like superwoman and I'm trying to combat like all of these little like monsters and, you know, political games. Um, really, I let it roll off my shoulders and I talk to them like, why are they kind of being negative? Like, and it, not necessarily that abrasive, but I am kind of an abrasive person when it comes to my Chicagoness. Um, I ask them like, well, what's holding you back from getting involved? Why don't you feel that what we're doing is relevant to you? How can we change that for you? And I've actually had some people that are writers join on and I'm, I'm looking for PR people. I'm looking for copywriters. The more that you utilize your talent, the more I'm going to kind of show the world what you can do. And really that, that helps you get jobs and it helps your networking. So I, I kind of, those are my pet projects. People that are really kind of like, I don't want to be part of you. Well, why? I'm going to change that perception for you. Uh, I, I think uh, just more on a philosophical level, it, it has to do with a, a value perception. And many people join organizations because they expect the organization to solve a problem of theirs, whether that be uh, employment or uh, career advancement, some sort of training. And so as April was mentioning, it's really important to talk to those members and find out what they do value and, and how you can provide that solution for them. Does that answer your question? Um, uh, we recently started monetizing a job board, um, so that's uh, an additional revenue stream for us. Uh, it's by no means uh, anywhere near what we generate in, uh, in event revenue. It's probably less than 1% of our, our gross revenues, but if we could get that up to 5%, even 10%, uh, just through the job board, I mean, that would be a, a fantastic revenue stream. Um, we're looking at ways to, to monetize that, that digitized content. Um, it, we're, we're really grappling with a lot of the same issues that uh, the New York Times or, or the Washington Post, how are they, you know, they're locking down this content and trying to find some sort of subscription model. So we're, we're looking at that, you know, once we get that content online, do we give it away for free like Ted does? Or, you know, is, is it kind of available as an archive only to members? Uh, we still haven't figured that out yet, but um, I, I would say right now probably 70% of our revenue is, is driven from from those events, so it's a, a pretty hefty chunk. But yeah, we, we are definitely looking at other revenue streams, um, even merchandising. Uh, there's, you know, potential of, uh, one of our uh, pet initiatives is called Only in LA, and uh, it's basically a side project of ours to, to brand Los Angeles as a, a center of creativity. And so there's a, the possibility that in the future, this could be the new I Heart New York campaign for, for the city of Los Angeles, and we're actually working with local government, we're working with the Los Angeles Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we're, we're tapping into a lot of resources to try to drive this campaign. So since we technically own the trademark in the future, if that does get to a level of iHeart New York, that would be an additional revenue stream as well. Does that answer your question? Um, what we've actually talked about is during the Unplugged and Plugged In series, where it's educational. Um, and literally, like, I got my iPad and I had no idea how to do, like, the things. And our communication director came in and brought in maybe, like, 10 people on a Saturday. And we had lunch and we sat and we learned how to use the iPad. And for kind of, like, you know, office use. Like, how to really turn your iPad into a functional, profitable thing other than Angry Birds and now Tiny Towers. Um, so that's been really great is because we're listening to our members saying that they want educational stuff. They don't just want speakers up there talking about their portfolios. They really want to find stuff that they can take back home and they can really say, here, as you're buying my corporate membership, I am giving you this back because I spoke up and I told my membership and my organization I wanted these things. Um, we're talking about doing virtual kind of roundtables. Um, we host a lot of roundtables. We're doing a luncheon series where somebody from Pennebaker is coming in and talking about kind of branding and stuff like that. So we're really kind of just getting outside of just drinks and appetizers and socials to really making sure that you leave and it changes you and you have that aha moment and you're like, I'm going to go do this and it's going to make me stronger and better as a creative.
All right, Aaron, just because you're technically my boss. That is my hardest question ever. What do you want? Well, I work, I want to buy. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a sales guy. I don't want to sell, right? Sales and employees. That's pretty much the two things that make me sad and sick of it. The job meeting people that actually have some kind of knowledge of what we do, those type of things are probably a really big deal. And then outside of that, I think meeting, uh, that making that connection between us, Simple Web Marketing. We right now, um, that's one of my biggest things is because a lot of time it's the individual people that have the corporate membership that come and they kind of build their skills. We, we really encourage that. But now we're looking to corporations and saying, okay, you're building the skills of your team members. That's fantastic. But how do we really highlight the corporation and really build you know, the profitability of the corporations? And we're looking to you guys to help us with that because nobody has really the perfect model for that. But we want to hear it from the, you know, the owners and the CEOs and the execs and the art directors. What do you want? What are going to be those key elements that are going to get you involved, make you come from your office when you are slammed with work and come socialize with us? Does that mean that we have industry parties where we invite potential people? Do you invite potential clients and we have a huge industry party for you? Again, we're really looking to you guys to kind of help mold the beneficial aspect of having a corporate membership. It's a, in, in my eyes, it's really a dichotomy because what we've seen is the largest corporate members that we have don't necessarily need or utilize the services that we offer. The smallest corporate members that we have are the ones that need us the most. And what I mean by that is, is when you're the, the size of Google or Yahoo, you have an internal training program. You, you don't need to come to, uh, for instance, a, a few weeks ago, we did a, a class on uh, presentation skills they likely will bring in a trainer for them. But what we do is we hire a, a, a presentation skills coach and then we pool people from a lot of different companies together in order to, uh, to make it affordable for them to actually get that, uh, that training. So it's, it, it, it's a challenge, but I, I think for some of the larger corporations, what the biggest thing that we can help with is, is feed new talent into the industry. And so that's what we're trying to do with this new student initiative to get them involved and actually feed them into uh, the, the companies that we work with in Los Angeles. Does that answer your question? All right, well, thank you guys for sticking with us. And thank you, April and Tony.